Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. I'm so excited to be with you here today as we approach another subject in American history. Today we're going to learn about muckraking! How cool of a word is that? And I'm going to tell you why I'm so excited to teach you this word, because it's a word that isn't just taught in context of American history. And we're going to do that, short and sweet and simple, and you're going to be like, oh my god, I understand it. But it's something that I think is important for today, for all of the world's citizens to know about, because muckraking really is the WD-40 of change. So, strap on your boots, man, put on your goggles, put your hats of learning on, I don't care what the hell you do, but get ready, because here it comes for learning. Alright, muckraking, man. What a visual word. Muckraking is a very simple concept. The idea is that you first need to gather up some muck. So you grab a rake and you rake up the muck and you find some type of problem in America or in the world like this stinky cloth and then you serve it up to people. Maybe you put it into a book. Maybe you put it into a hip-hop song. Maybe you put it into a movie. But whatever you're doing, you're trying to let people know about this problem. And then, of course, the awesome effect is when people start finding out about child um, homelessness or about uh, sex abuse or about unsafe working conditions or uh, whatever it is, they're going to start stomping their feet and raising their fists. It is really the WD-40, like I said before, of populism, of getting the voice spread. So people can start to bang and yell and scream and demand change. Think of the Industrial Age, and let's go to historical context now. And in the Industrial Age, we, we, we taught you that the government's hands are basically up. The idea of laissez-faire economics that we have rapid economic growth and allow that occur naturally in capitalism. Get the government out of the way and just watch the wheels of capitalism churn out jobs and profit and uh, new products and innovation. Now, the negative effect of that, of that Adam Smith model of capitalism, is that you basically have some negative effects in the short term, and probably some people would argue in the long term. But when the government's not watching, profit sometimes is going to override safety. So you might have um, products going out to the consumers that are unsafe. Um, you might have people that are working in conditions that are very dangerous. You may have child labor. You may have pollution and uh, you know air that you can't breathe and all of these negative effects. So what the muckraker is doing is he's going, yo, problem. And then of course we look for the change, for the effect. So let's take a look at three or four examples that you're definitely going to see on your exam or if you're studying American history, they're going to come up um, all the time. And let's see if we can't nail them to a plank and move on with our lives. So again, historical context, right? First start in the 19th century, late 19th century, and talk, if you're doing an essay or if you're, you're trying to get this in your head, about the problems of the Industrial Age, of the Gilded Age. Mark Twain called it the Gilded Age because on the surface, you know, it looks, it looks top notch, but if you dig under the surface, you're going to find that we have lots of problems, especially when it relates to poor people, whether that's the urban problem, urbanization and immigration, or it's a rural problem of farmers and railroads and um, uh, um, um, a lack of competition and, you know, those types of issues. So here are your three or four kind of novels, books. And remember, today it could be any type of media um, that is um, informing people of a problem. But the ones that pop up on the exam all the time are going to be, number one, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Without a doubt, that's the one that I see most often on exams. Upton Sinclair was actually a socialist. And uh, socialism probably has a lot of negative connotations today, but socialism is the idea um, of some type of communal aspect of society where we take care of a problem together. Um, complete socialism would be called communism, where the government owns private property and uh, businesses and, 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 and um, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, if you look at something like a school system or a library or a fire department, that in a, in a sense is socialism because we're all chipping in and we're all paying for something and we all, you know, enjoy the benefits of that. And at the same time, it kind of operates as, you know, an escalating staircase to opportunity. So Upton Sinclair is writing about that. 
He's writing about workers' lives and socialism and trying to, you know, change capitalism to give workers more of a control and ownership over their lives. Um, unfortunately for his mission, for his objective, he chose a slaughterhouse. So if you're going to write about workers and you want people to be like, oh, the poor workers, don't choose a slaughterhouse. Because when people read um, the jungle, they weren't really reading about the lives of the immigrant workers. They were reading about what related to them. I think it was Upton Sinclair who stated, and I'll get the quote wrong, that I aimed for their hearts and I hit them in their stomachs. So the jungle really about slaughterhouses has passages in it about contaminated meat and feces and rats and just kind of the, you know, the brutal, <laughs> unsanitary conditions that are going on in slaughterhouses. So of course there is an immediate public reaction to this book, which is basically, ew, do something. And this is the big kind of idea that muckraking through populism and through, you know, disseminating this information is gonna light a fire. And that fire is under the neath of is underneath the feet of the federal government. Isn't that right, Noam Chomsky? And that if you get that fire hot enough, and of course muckraking is an accelerant because it's gonna make the flames go even higher, you eventually will get the government to do something. Now, Upton Sinclair wants the government to own that factory, but that's not what Teddy Roosevelt's going to do in the early 1900s. He is going to pass, not pass a law, but sign a law, Congress of course passes laws, to regulate that industry, the meat industry. So the, the, the laws that you would put in an essay would you know, simply be the Meat Inspection Act, which is going to create um, you know, a regulatory body that's going to inspect the meat. And Hughes is a vegetarian, I'm not even going there, but that's the concept. And then we get the FDA, the Food and Drug Act, or the Pure Food and uh, Drug and Labeling Act, which is going to put the ingredients on the side of your food, so you know what you're consuming. That you have a right as a consumer to have that information. If capitalism isn't delivering that, because people are ignorant or they don't know about it, as a group, a communal group, we can force the government or put pressure on the government to regulate that industry. Not to own that industry, but to make that industry safe for consumers. So cross that off the list, man. Upton Sinclair, the socialist, the jungle, slaughterhouses, buh, 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 effect, uh, Meat Inspection Act and the FDA. All right, let's do a couple more. I know we could do a couple more. You're still awake? Say cheese. Jacob Reese, How the Other Half Lives. This shows you that it doesn't have to be um, a book in the, in, in the novel sense. Jacob Reese is a photographer, a journalist photographer that is informing people of conditions in the urban slums. I'm not sure if it was Jacob Reese that invented it, but I know it has something to do with the invention of indoor photography, which is going to allow Jacob Reese to go kind of not just into the city, but into the insides of the cities, into the tenement houses, to take pictures like you see right now, which are really going to force Americans to take a, a close look at how the other half lives. That's what the book is called, How the Other Half Lives. And this is going to lead to really pressure to have the government clean up cities, to have a uh, not just city management movements, but to, you know, sewer systems. And we get settlement houses, Jane Addams, which is not necessarily the government, but that there is an effect here. So Jacob Reese, how the other half lives, and the federal government, and at least the state and local governments, are going to start dealing with the problems of the effects of urbanization over crowdedness because of the influx of immigrants and cheap labor. All right, Jacob Reese, how the other half lives. Let's do a couple more. Oh, the octopus. This is a very visual one, guys. Uh, Frank Norris wrote The Octopus, I believe late 1800s, early 1900s. I'm going to say early 1900s. Why does 1906? Someone's going to Google it now. But Frank Norris wrote the book about The Octopus about really farmers and railroads. This is at the time of the Grange. Um, easy way to remember the Grange. You go, home, home on the Grange. That should at least put you into farmer land, man. The Grange is a basically a cooperative or a group of farmers that are pooling their resources because they're dealing, you know, with huge banks and huge railroad companies that aren't really serving their interests. So Frank Norris is going to let people know about this problem about railroads and the basically uh, the non-competitive industry uh, devices they're using to screw the farmer. And this is going to lead to the passage of 
a federal law. The octopus, and visually I think of a railroad because you have the octopus, like the hub is kind of the central station, and then there's all the eight testic <laughs> hey, tentacles, which would kind of represent the railroad. And, you know, the idea is that those tentacles, careful use, is going to squeeze out the competition. And, you know, that's very unfair. So we're going to get the federal government again. Get the idea, right? Under the feet. And then we get the Hepburn Act. Say it with me. The Hepburn Act. And this is, in a sense, an anti-capitalistic law. It says to the railroad companies, there's a limit, baby. You can't charge more than but the cha ching And in capitalism, of course, the idea is you should be able to charge as much as you want. And if people don't use your product, then you're going to have to lower your price or go out of business. But the idea here, and Frank Norris is showing, is there isn't competition. That the railroad companies are taking advantage of their position in society. Remember, the railroads got built through economic nationalism. The federal government gave huge tracts of lands away as a subsidy in order to get the railroad built. So the community, the people, already have a buy-in. You know, we already have a buy-in because it was our government that gave that land. So we want some fairness. So, Frank Norris, the octopus, the Hepburn Act. You guys can do that. Look, there's other ones, man. Uh, Ida Tarbell, uh, the history of Standard Oil. I would consider Mark Twain to be a muckraker. Um, you know... It's all over in the early 1900s. And this is really what's going to set into motion the progressive era, starting with Teddy Roosevelt and going into Woodrow Wilson before the start of World War I. Um, look, man, we could talk about this forever, but we have to uh, kind of close this baby down. But remember that there are muckrakers today. Um, I tell my kids, and we talk about it all the time, there's two kinds of music. There's bubblegum music and there is muckraking music. So whatever genre of music that you listen to, someone out there is singing or rapping or yelling about some type of issue that's important that they want to inform you about. Not so you can go into a closet and close your eyes and forget about it, but so you can stomp your feet, so you can light your fires and get your government to do something. So there you go guys, muckraking, right? Isn't that fun to say? You dirty muckraker! Ha <laughs> ha! All right, go down below and you're gonna see that you can not only subscribe to Hip Hughes, which if you don't do, I'm just gonna have to come and pumble you, but other EDU gurus that I want you to subscribe to, my friends that are doing science and math and Spanish and Japanese and all kinds of cool channels, and then just other awesome EDU channels that I've listed below, like Viheart and Smarter Every Day and uh, uh, Minute Physics and My Brain's Exploding and Oh My God and Noam Chomsky, what are we gonna do? Awesome. YouTube, learning, I love it, press buttons, 